Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, A New Approach of COVID-19 Surveillance Testing to Maximize the Identification of Asymptomatic Patients. I am Michelle Ashton of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Diasorn. To learn more, visit diasorn.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credit. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Vittorio Sambri, Associate Professor and Head of the Unit of Microbiology, the Greater Mermagna Area Hub Laboratory, DIMES University of Bologna. Vittorio, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And it's a pleasure for me to be here tonight and uh, to share with the audience uh, some of the newest results that we got in my laboratory in, uh, in Italy. So the title of my talk will be a new approach to COVID-19 surveillance testing to maximize the identification of asymptomatic patients. And um, please check my financial disclosure. These are my potential conflicts of interest and I would like to disclose them, of course. And uh, this is the agenda of my talk of tonight. So we will start with the some data about the epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2 infection, giving you a global view and uh, a more detailed information about what is going on in Emilia-Romagna, uh, that is my region, and in Italy in particular. Uh, we will discuss about the uh, necessity to make a statement about the specimen collection type and priority, because, of course, testing for COVID has not the same priority, and you cannot do that uh, uh, collecting the same type of, of, of specimen. And um, we will discuss about uh, some uh, diagnostic and screening tests to detect the COVID-19 infection, and the role in particular, and the role of antigenic assay and the role of molecular testing, because I believe that these two uh, different approaches are very different one from another, and uh, we need to go into a, a deeper knowledge about uh, each one of these uh, different possibilities to make the laboratory diagnosis of COVID-19 infection. And in particular, I will, I will share at the end of my talk the experience of my laboratory in the uh, very recent use of uh, antigenic assay for the screening of uh, asymptomatic subjects. And uh, of course, I will try to uh, provide some take home messages, but uh, that will be more a, you know, a method of discussion at the end of this talk. So let's start to give you an overview uh, about the COVID-19 ongoing pandemic. These are data just collected yesterday, December 15, 2020. And it's impressive to know that uh, more than 71 million people uh, have been confirmed as cases of COVID-19. Uh, of course, this number is uh, an underestimate uh, number because many countries are underreporting uh, and there is no confirmation for cases of suspected COVID-19 in a large part of Asia and Africa where the uh, diagnostic resources are not so freely and completely available like in the Western countries. And um, it is also impressive to me that more than 1,600,000 people die about the, uh, died according to the data reported by the WHO for COVID-19. It's an impressive call for that. And um, yeah, let's move. Uh, to give into, into a more detailed information about the countries in EU within the, the uh, well, it's not, uh, not, not completely true because UK is just leaving EU, but European countries, let me, let me uh, define this list this, in this way. And you see here that uh, we have cumulative cases for each country with more than 2 million cases in, in France and about the same number of cases in the UK and in Italy, just following a short distance by 
Spain, with a lower number in Germany, Poland, and Turkey. And uh, the reported cases in the last uh, 24 hours, the data are related to yesterday, if I correctly remember. Uh, if I correctly remember. So we, we have the second, actually the second number of new cases in the EU with about 18,000 cases just following UK, that is just about 18,000 cases. And you see here that the, the cumulative, that uh, uh, it's, it's impressive, especially in Italy with more than 60, almost 65,000 people that die according to the, to the uh, data uh, made public by our Ministry of Health. And of course, there is a huge impact on our daily life uh, made by this ongoing pandemic. And um, this is just uh, a summary of the first pages of a very uh, widely read uh, Italian newspaper that uh, starts from uh, the very beginning at the end of February, uh, this, this current year in 2020, with uh, saying the virus in Italia, one die. Uh, so that was the first report, and it finished with the very last uh, uh, information about the decision made by France and Germany to uh, have a, a more extended lockdown situation uh, during the Christmas season. And that's, uh, of course, uh, a necessity because the counting of the people that is dying currently for for this disease is too high, and we do need to stop this enormous amount of people that is dying. And uh, I told you that we will discuss about the, the uh, Italian situation, and uh, it starts uh, February 27, uh, started the case-based surveillance system that was established and focused on suspected and confirmed COVID-19 severe respiratory infection cases. Uh, the RT-PCR testing of nasopharyngeal swaps were performed at regional level to confirm the diagnosis of all suspected COVID-19 cases. And the COVID-19 uh, infection emerged in our country with a clustering answer like the one that was described in Wuhan in China and likewise showed worse outcome in older male uh, comorbidities. That was the highest group, the largest group of population that was affected by severe COVID-19 or the initial R with zero it was 2.96 in Lombardy. That explained very, very well the high case load and rapid geographical spread that was observed. And um, at the very bottom of the slide does report the uh, very last data. Uh, we had 1,080,000 cases, a little bit more, with uh, about 80,000 uh, uh, healthcare providers involved. And the main age uh, for the cases was 48 years. This is a major difference with the so-called first wave. Because in the first wave, we had a, a, a very, a, 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 the, the median age of the people that was affected by COVID-19 in the first wave was by far older, uh, more than 65. And this is uh, an explanation that uh, derived from the, I would say, uh, misbehavior that many people, young people, is having in this, in this uh, time uh, about the COVID-19. Uh, you don't see so much difference in between the percentage of male and female affected. And the total, uh, the total death toll is more than 60,000 is a case fatality rate of about 3.4%. And uh, we have a, a little bit less than 1 million people that recovered and are apparently healthy right now after the uh, experience of COVID-19. So it's a picture that is quite uh, worrying. And um, in this slide, we report the proportion of COVID-19 cases of COVID-19 notified in Italy by age group. Uh, the data are available for the almost uh, total 1,800,000 cases reported. You see here that the highest group affected is the 
group of age in between 50 and 59. And uh, the mortality that is reported by the red portion of these bars is just uh, starting to be evident in these uh, very high uh, involved group, but it starts to become more uh, relevant, at, at least in proportion to the total number of affected people in the uh, older uh, age group, and in particular from uh, 80 to 89. It is also of note that uh, we have very relevant uh, information about the asymptomatic and pouchy symptomatic number of people involved. Uh, it's probably not only a, a, a causal uh, effect, but is due to the fact, this behavior is due to the fact that uh, we are right now testing more and more also people that are not suspected cases, but they are just uh, suspected contact of cases or potential cases. That means that most of the activity that we are doing right now in the, in the laboratory in Italy to uh, control the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic is dedicated to the detection of people that has no symptoms related to COVID. And you see here that the green portion of these bars that are related to different age groups is still very high. Even in the uh, lower, in the lowest case, that is the age group in between 70 and 79, the total count of asymptomatic and pouch symptomatic people is well above 50%. And it's also noteworthy to uh, underline that the number of critical or severe cases is increasing again in the oldest population, starting from 60 to 69, with the peak, from, as, as we saw before, for mortality in the age group from 80 to 89. So there is, this is epidemiological behavior that is a little bit different from the, the one that we saw in the first wave, because in the first wave, the number of asymptomatic people or pouch symptomatic people that we detected was much lower, but it was because, this was because of different strategy for testing. In the first wave, we were just testing the people that were suspected or clinically suspected to have COVID-19. We were not going around trying, trying to trace the potential contact or to trace the people that have been potentially, have been potentially exposed to COVID-19. Uh, that's completely different right now because almost more than two thirds of our activity is dedicated to contact tracing right now. And let's move a little bit in uh, what is our healthcare, public healthcare, healthcare organization in the region. Uh, just to give you an idea where we are located, we are in red uh, in, in this map, and um, we are in the south of northern Italy. We are the southernmost region of the northern part of the country, and uh, we have a public health organization that divides the area in three different big macro areas. One is called Area Vasta Emilia Nord, you see here in pink. Area Vasta Emilia Centro is in uh, uh, different shades of green. And there is Romania, where I'm located, that are uh, the, that uh, is this part in, in, in blue and light blue. Okay. Okay, I get it. And just to provide you a, dis a, 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 a a little bit of information about uh, the uh, healthcare organization that we have in here in Romania. We have centralized the, uh, all the service laboratory in uh, March 2009, and we do uh, anything in uh, uh, laboratory medicine for the whole area of Romania. Uh, the organization of my laboratory is so-called Hub and Spokes, even if I do prefer to call it uh, geographically spread laboratory, because we, we do have a, a, a central health laboratory that is located here in Pieve Sistina, that is in the geographical area, in the geographical center of the area, sorry. And we still have seven urgency laboratories that are located in the major uh, uh, hospital that are decentralized. They are open 
24 hour a day for seven days in a week. And in the central laboratory, we have the unit of clinical pathology, my unit of microbiology and, my, and medical genetics as well. The laboratory system in Romania perform about one, 21 million tests per year, and the overall operating hours are 8 to 6.30 Monday to, to Saturday, and on Sunday we are open from 8 to 4 p.m. And um, uh, again, to provide you with uh, some more detail about the organization of this hub and spoke laboratory, uh, we, had, uh, we have seven laboratories on site. The population we serve is 1,200,000, uh, but you should be aware that uh, we are located along the coast of the Adriatic Sea, and this uh, portion of the Adriatic coast uh, is uh, one of the most popular touristic spots uh, for uh, summer season in Italy and in Europe. So during the period of time from June the 1st to September the 3rd, uh, along this uh, part of the Adriatic coast, we have more than 7 million tourists coming in. Of course, they come for entertainment and for seaside, but of course they can get sick. So the, the, the living population is 1 million and 200,000, but we are expecting to uh, be prepared to serve a little bit more because of this huge touristic looks that we get during the uh, summertime. And we have presently about 100 sampling collection sites uh, on, uh, on the spots, and we serve uh, 15 different public and private hospitals in, uh, in, in the area. Um, okay, so let's move to uh, something more related to COVID. And uh, we will be discussing something about the uh, sample collection uh, that uh, we are currently using for the largest possible percentage of the sample we are getting uh, into the laboratory for the uh, COVID-19 uh, diagnostic. Uh, well, it is well established that the nasopharyngeal specimen, the nasopharyngeal secretion collected by swab preferably a flocked swab, when possible, when available, is the preferred sample according to the FDA recommendation as well as the ECDC recommendation. So nasopharyngeal secretion collected by flocked swab is the best possible specimen to make the uh, diagnosis of COVID-19, but also nasal swabs, provided that is a true nasal swab, so you should go at least three to four centimeter inside the, the, the nasal uh, 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 district, and uh, it could be used. It's a, it's a good alternative as well. It is a, a good alternative also the oropharyngeal specimen that uh, uh, can be collected whenever the collection of nasopharyngeal or nasal swab is not um, possible according to the patient condition or whatsoever. Uh, environmental limitation you may have. So the swabs should be placed immediately into a sterile transport tube that contains two to three milliliter of um, a transport medium that can be uh, used to guarantee the uh, stability of the biological material collected in this way. Uh, the, the stability should be guaranteed for the RNA from the virus, the genomic material, as well as the antigenic material, and in particular the protein that can be used for the detection of the antigen uh, testing. Um, of course, the standardization of these, and, and of course you can see here that we can have a, a UTM or anus transfer medium or even sterized line it's an acceptable transport medium, provided that you keep the, the collector swab in, a, in, the, in the right uh, condition of temperature and humidity. And so the standardization of the pre-analytical steps uh, is uh, it's now not so easy because um, we are experiencing a shortage of collection device and uh, we do need to move uh, and to organize the laboratory workflow in order to accommodate many, at least three presently. I was just checking this with my co-worker this early this afternoon. 
and we need to accommodate at least three different types of collection tubes into our implementation that it's quite a mess because you need to you know modify the software that to manage these implementation according to the tube you are loading and um, of course the nasal pharyngeal swaps in UTM or VTM that are the universal or viral transfer media should be uh, the preferred as I just told you should be the preferred um, collection type and uh, this must be done going very deep in the nasopharyngeal cavity. It was told that the area for the right collection should be in the middle in between the eye and the ear. It's a very deep collection site. And um, I did it myself many times, and it's totally unpleasant. So I believe that the patients are complaining about that and uh, it's very understandable that they, they are complaining because they, this is a very un unpleasant procedure. Uh, what we have available right now for the uh, laboratory diagnosis of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, well, basically in my laboratory, we are currently using seven real-time PCR because we need to you know, combine the different necessity of uh, turnaround time, uh, uh, personnel availability, and uh, overall laboratory organization. So we are currently using with seven different methods for the detection by RT-PCR of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and just to try to summarize, the molecular test uh, detects, of course, the genetic material from the virus, and nasal or throat swab is collected, and uh, of course, RT-PCR uh, is performed with the amplification uh, after retro retrotranscription of RNA and cDNA. And uh, what tells you this type of test is, okay, you are bearing RNA from the virus or you are not bearing RNA from the virus. That overall translated into the clinical setting is you are infected now or you are not infected now. Well, this must be very uh, critically uh, interpreted because the presence of RNA by itself is not a sign of active infection. Of course, it's hard to uh, imagine how one can bear the RNA without the replication of the virus. But, you know, the exact information you get by using this molecular testing is you are bearing, you are loading, loaded with Molecular, with RNA from the virus. Of course, you can use also antibody testing. And the antibody testing can be performed on capillary blood or on vein puncture, uh, and it tells you that uh, you were infected in the past or that you are presently infected. But it's not so easy to set up a time frame in which you can establish with a high level of certainty the starting time of this infection. That means, okay, antibody, an, an antibody test positivity means you, you meet with the virus. If you have IgM, IgM you, I can tell you that you, are, you have been meeting the virus not so, not so uh, far away in the past, but uh, I cannot just tell you you are still infected or not. If you have just IgG, uh, the only information we can uh, we can uh, conclude is okay. You have been infected in the past, and this could be more than uh, three weeks ago or four weeks ago. And um, of course, uh, we very recently, starting from November, that is one month ago. Uh, we had uh, the information about the availability of uh, antigenic tests uh, uh, performable on uh, uh, instrumentation located into the laboratory and namely on the liaison Excel. And so we decided to move also in this direction because this kind of test is uh, providing additional and different information from the molecular test. The antigenic test is um, just detecting the presence of um, antigen-related uh, protein, antigenic-related protein uh, in the same uh, uh, nasal swabs collected uh, as for the molecular testing. 
And uh, of course, there is a kind of um, combination to demonstrate uh, the, the presence of immune complex uh, made by the uh, antibody that captured the antigen and the secondary antibody that detect the presence of the first immune complex. And the information that uh, is achievable by using this kind of test is that you are presently infected. Uh, more or less the same information that you are, uh, you can derive from the results of the molecular testing. Uh, yeah, we we selected to start uh, to work with the uh, liaison SARS-CoV-2 antigen kits, and you see here the the different uh, availability of these, uh, the different component of this kit that are required to perform the test on these uh, liaison XL instrumentation. It's of note that uh, the, the test should be, uh, must be uh, performed on tubes that contain a sample inactivation buffer. That means that once you put the secretion, and we will see that you can collect the secretion by using a direct dry swab or by using the UTM or something related to UTM or VTM, uh, when, once you put the sample in these tubes that contain this inactivation buffer, uh, the viability and the capacity to infect of the virus is completely gone. So it's a safety measure that makes uh, life easier for people that need to manage this workflow in the laboratory. Well, you see here the technical specification of the antigenic assay uh, provided by the SRIN. So it's of note that uh, the first time to results uh, when you load the series of sample on the liaison XL is 42 minutes, so it's quite a fast turnaround time. And the true output is uh, uh, more than 130 tests per hour. That means about 700 tests per working shift of uh, 8 to 12 hours. So the limit of detection is analytical sensitivity is about 22 TCID 50 per milliliter. And the clinical sensitivity uh, is varying from 97.1, uh, depending on the type of the of the uh, specimen. This is for nasal swabs, and this is for nasopharyngeal swabs. Uh, and you see that there is no so much difference about the clinical specificity. So, according to these data, this uh, test is really promising because uh, uh, it shows a very high level of sensitivity and specificity. So, um, of course, the, 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 the first question that raises when the uh, new test has been uh, proposed in our workflow was, okay, but how these perform in, perform in comparison with the RT-PCR? So that's, that's the question that also the clinician made to us. So, okay, we can switch to these antigenic uh, detection-based tests, but how can we uh, compare with the result that we are getting since the last uh, nine months that are based on RT-PCR? And of course, the, the, major, uh, the major issue was to state, uh, to stratify the RT-PCR according to the cycle threshold or the famous CT counts. Uh, of course, I'm not so in favor of uh, using the CT counts uh, as a measure of uh, the level of RNA that is contained in, uh, in the specimen because the CT are highly variable depending on the uh, target gene, the, the probes and primers that are used for amplification. And so it's not an exact measure of the amount of RNA that you have in the sample. But anyway, it's uh, widely used, so the stratification was performed according to different classes of CT, less than 24, 25, 29, and major, more than 30 and unknown. So you see here that the specificity is very high on nasal swab as well as uh, equally high on nasopharyngeal swabs and that uh, even if you are dealing with a sample that showed a CT above 30, the specificity is quite high and uh, 
there was a very few number of equivocal samples. So it's very uh, promising again. So um, how we use how I think we using these uh, uh, these uh, uh, combination of uh, tests that are currently available in my uh, laboratory for the detection of COVID-19. Okay, we serve 15 hospital class outpatient living in this uh, area of the region. We collect the sample in patients with suspected symptoms, and we collect about, on a daily basis, 6,000 samples per for PCR and about 1,000 sample per day for screening of asymptomatic subject by using the uh, antigenic assay uh, based on DSRN. So the second step is, the third step is of course, the transfer to the laboratory, the sample preparation and the processing of the uh, sample for NAT processing. And we of course need to have a stratification of the priority of the uh, sample that we manage each day because we do need to uh, discern the fastest possible test to the most relevant mm -hmm. under the epidemiological or clinical point of view uh, for the uh, for the uh, sample that we are we are getting. Uh, so we, according to the priority that we receive from the clinical side, we stratify the sample as red coded, yellow coded, or green coded. And the red coded must be reported with the turnaround time of two hours. Yellow is six hour turnaround time and green is within 24 hours from the arrival of the sample in the laboratory. So we work on these different specification of priority. And um, what are right now doing is for, for the screening surveillance of people that are suspected for, for COVID-19 infection, is to collect the nasal swabs from at the collection site that could be either hospital or drive-through uh, location in the territory. And uh, we collect the sample. Uh, we, at the beginning, we were collecting the sample in UTM or VTM tubes that are stable at 12 hours, for 12 hours at two to eight uh, degrees Celsius. And uh, whenever the sample arrived into the laboratory, we started to perform the virus inactivation steps that is transferred the UTN tube into the inactivation buffer and to leave two hours this inactivation buffer at room temperature in order to allow a complete viral inactivation. And then it should be tested on the liaison Excel. Well, we shift, we switch it to a, a simpler method that is collecting the swabs directly into the inactivation buffer tubes. That means the virus inactivation is just 30 minutes, but it's uh, already performing due to the transfer of the uh, samples from the collection site to the laboratory. So you don't need to sit and wait for two hours before performing the testing after the uh, uh, arrival of the tubes in the laboratory because this virus inactivation test is already in place immediately after the collection. And this is a very, 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 very convenient uh, uh, possibility. Uh, who are we screening on this uh, surveillance pro program based on uh, antigenic testing? Well, basically we are screening school population uh, healthcare providers and people living in nursing homes. This is because in these three different types of population, the screening activity is uh, extremely easy to be scheduled. So we know exactly how many samples we can collect with this limitation of about 1,000 per day. That is the upper limit that, that we can manage on a 24 hour shift. And so we just selected these three different types of population, school population, people living in the nursing homes, and healthcare provider exposed to COVID-19. Um, what we do right now is to uh, have this new approach of uh, uh, surveillance for COVID-19, because of course, if you go for screening by RT-PCR, and you will bear in mind that we have a priority list, the surveillance testing is fitting exactly in the green-coded uh, series of specimens. 
So we cannot perform a very fast uh, uh, testing on green coded. It's a 24 hours. So RT PCR with green code is typically reported within 24 hours. While the antigen detection is uh, much faster and uh, allow us to uh, start very soon the contact tracing and to go for you know uh, deeper investigation uh, of positive results uh, and at the very end it's more efficient in uh, stopping the transmission of the virus rather than using the RT PCR. So the WHO guideline that uh, has been has been uh, uh, published on September 11th uh, this year are related to antigen detection, uh, the, the use of antigen detection tests in the diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2, and this is mainly related to rapid immune assay. That is the lateral flow assay group or even the immunofluorescence group. This is not uh, uh, completely uh, applicable to the uh, uh, test we are discussing now. And um, the summary of this WHO guideline is more or less this one. The target analyzes is the virus nucleocapsid protein that is preferred because of relative abundance rather than the S protein. The nucleocapsid protein is much more uh, uh, released into the uh, upper respiratory tract uh, secretion than the S protein. Uh, the sample collection material are generally available in the commercial kit, and the results are read by the operator within 10 to 30 minutes, uh, and it can be used as an instrument to help the reading, or it just uh, can just be done by you know visual inspection of the device. Uh, of course, these tests are uh, uh, feasible on nasal or nasopharyngeal swaps. Uh, there is a huge effort by many different companies to use alternative sample types such as saliva, but as, uh, as far as today, there is no uh, convincing clinical validation of these uh, uh, biological specimens for the detection of uh, antigen related to COVID-19 infection. So the performance should be uh, sensitivity about 8% and they should have a very high specificity ranging from 97 to 100%. And the preferred testing period for the antigen test is in between five to seven days following the onset of symptom and the shelf life of these uh, large majority of the tests uh, are uh, in between one year to one and a half year and the shipping temperature is more or less in between two to 30, temp 30 degrees. <laughs> so uh, of course the use of antigenic tests uh, uh, has many different possibilities uh, that are summarized in this slide. Uh, of course the first use possible use is to diagnose SARS-CoV-2 infection where NAAT is not available uh, or when uh, you need uh, to investigate the widespread community transmission the antigen may be used for early detection and for contact tracing may that they, they they provide a very rapid turnaround time so that the contact tracing could be performed in a more efficient way uh, of course and the use of antigenic tests is advised when the plunger TAT of real-time PCR uh, is excluding or is diminishing, is reducing the clinical uh, utility of the test, and also for the uh, outbreak investigation, such as the one that we were just uh, describing before. Um, which is the role of the antigenic test? The antigen, uh, antigen test, antigen-based testing could help to rapidly identify people who have high level of virus and those who are most likely to be infection to other and isolate them from the community. Well, uh, this graph summarizes the different, the three different possibilities that uh, uh, we uh, uh, described it so far in this lecture. This is the period of exp exposure to vi virus and these uh, uh, Brown curve is reporting the uh, 
the rapid antigenic test uh, uh, detectability. In gray, you see the detection of the RNA from the virus by RT-PCR, and in, uh, in these two different uh, uh, light blue and more dark blue, the detection of IgG and that body. But it is still unclear which is the viral load that is the threshold below which a person is no longer contagious. This is the question, because when you describe the test that uh, is capable to identify very extremely low number of viral or genome copies per mil, is it making sense in terms of, uh, is this making sense in terms of uh, capability to spread the infection? Well, I must confess I'm quite doubtful about this uh, statement, and uh, uh, we need to go for uh, more defined uh, uh, scientific data. So uh, there are scientific studies that report, uh, I would think nowadays we have many different studies that are uh, reporting this type of information that report a strong relation between the CT value and the ability to recover infectious virus in cell culture. The other of life virus is reduced by 32% for every one unit increase in the CT value. That is a very strong relation. Uh, in general, I would say that the cutoff uh, of CT uh, above uh, 33 or at maximum 35 is generally associated with non-infective samples detected within the first five to seven days following the onset of the symptoms. And the persistence of the symptom from mild to severe, it's strongly correlated with prolonged viral RNA shedding and recovery of virus. So we do need, uh, we do need to go for uh, a definition of these CT value threshold uh, because we do need to know if a people that is that being detected as positive by RT-PCR is actually infecting or is capable to spread, to shed the virus in, a, in, in an amount that is capable to infect healthy people that get in touch with the droplets emitted by these patients. This is a question mark that we still have, but we have some evidence, uh, as you say, more than one, uh, uh, that correlate very easily the probability of getting a positive result in cell culture when, when a sample is uh, um, treated with cell culture uh, in vitro with the cycle threshold and uh, according to the uh, uh, period of, of, uh, of beginning of the disease. So you see here that the cycle threshold is uh, decreasing over time, and uh, the probability to get the positive result is higher when you test uh, a, a, a patient in the very first uh, five days, maximum seven days from the onset of the, of the disease. And you see here that the probability of getting a positive uh, culture is decreasing over time and over the availability of the uh, uh, cycle threshold, a very, very low level. So that means that the PCR is, the PCR, if a PCR is positive uh, uh, with a CT threshold above 35 or 30, uh, 33 or 35, and the, the, the sample is collected after the first five to seven days from the onset of the disease. And the probability to have a very, to have a positive result in cell culture is extremely low, if any. So that means that we should be able, in order to control the pandemic and the spread in, among the asymptomatic population, to identify the people that are in this condition. We should not care too much about the people that are in this area of distress. So, okay, there is a very nice paper just coming out in uh, New England Journal of Medicine by Michael Miner, and uh, that states uh, that uh, we have two different possibility uh, to control the uh, epidemic we are currently uh, living with. Uh, 
should we improve the frequency of testing or as an alternative, should we improve the sensitivity of our test? These are two completely different approaches that are summarized in these uh, uh, graphs. You see here that uh, the, green, the, the blue curve is the viral load over time. And you see here that if you test these uh, uh, people by using a test with high analytical sensitivity like PCR, but the low, at the low frequency or lower frequency because it's not possible to perform PCR uh, many times in a week or many times in a month, you, you see that you can pick up this is a positive result. You can pick up a positive result in a, in a, in a post infectious positive period by PCR. While if you go for a, a, a lower sensitivity testing by antigenic testing, but you use this test in a very frequent way, that is possible because these tests are less expensive or less complicated than they are PCR, you have a very high probability to pick up a positive result during the infectious stage that characterize this part of the disease. So at the very end, I believe that is not so relevant to test with a very high sensitivity test uh, if you want to control the pandemic in asymptomatic population, basically. Um, and uh, I'm coming to the end of my lecture, and so I want to share with you the result that we got in the last week of November. We tested 6,852 asymptomatic patients by using the uh, liaison XL antigenic testing. And you see here that um, according to the dose detected, uh, the, the test states that if the dose is lower than 100 PCID 50 milli per milliliter, the test is negative, and you see here that we had a huge percentage of tests with uh, 50 TCID or 75 and even a little bit less, but still a, a huge proportion of, of negative with 100 TCID uh, level. There, these are negative, and these are above 100 and 200 that are positive. So you see here that the lower percentage of uh, positive tests that we got and it is of note that uh, we, we propose it to include in these testing a so-called gray zone from 100, above 100 to uh, 200 uh, TCID dose. And uh, you see here that this could be uh, very useful to enlarge the uh, detectability of the infecting uh, people. So, uh, Coming to the, the, the results uh, uh, into much detail, we had 90.8% uh, of very uh, of, of, of sample that are completely negative with a, a TCID uh, 50 per milliliter below 100. We had 6.7% uh, in the area of uh, TCID in between 100 and 150 and 0.6% in the area in between 150 and 200, and only 1.9% of strong positives with PCID detected above 200. That's, uh, that's quite um, uh, relevant because uh, 58 uh, samples were in between 100 and 200 uh, PCID that were run by RT-PCR, and five of those with 9% expressed in percentage, uh, uh, RT-PCR was positive with uh, CT value lower than 30. So we can estimate that 45 samples out of these uh, more than 6,000 uh, uh, samples should be positive. That corresponds to 0.7% of the routine work we do. And the remaining 6.6% of routine samples between 100 and 200 should be considered as negative. So um, the sensitivity is very elevated, even if you consider a, a, a sample, a threshold of 200 is 82%, but if you consider uh, a threshold of 100 PCID 50 is uh, 93%. Uh, 
And uh, in, in detail, in trying to summarize, we uh, screened uh, uh, from November to yesterday, to December, uh, more than 13,000 individuals were tested. We, we got a total of 20, 260 positive results uh, by antigenic testing. Of course, the population was the one that I just reported and described it to you. Uh, we considered that all of these 260 were confirmed by RT-PCR testing, and uh, we got confirmation by positive PCR in 232 cases, and we consider as a false positive reaction uh, 20, only 28 that were uh, negative by PCR. So the overall uh, specificity of the antigen test calculated in this way is 99.8%, and it could be uh, very easy to increase the surveillance of this population from the present, uh, based on our PCR testing, to 45 days to uh, twice in a month. So the prevalence of uh, currently positive in our area is 1.4%, uh, according to the data we got from the government. Uh, and um, uh, the percentage of positivity that we got by using the uh, antigen test is 1.7%, so it's not so far away from the uh, prevalence of the currently positive. But you should consider that uh, of those positive reported, 66.3% uh, are, uh, uh, are related to control swaps, and only 33.3% are deriving from swaps performed for diagnostic purposes on suspected cases. These are the two percentage in my, in my region, and you see that the different proportion of these two categories of uh, testing are, are uh, very relevantly uh, varying uh, from one region to another. So let's come to the conclusion. I would say that the rapid diagnostic test uh, uh, that is 42 minutes is achievable by using this high throughput platform with more than 130 tests per hour. Uh, it's helpful to stop the COVID-19 transmission because you can target isolation and cohorting of the most infected cases and their close contact in a very efficient and short time after the collection of the sample, less than uh, a shorter time than uh, if you go for RT-PCR testing, and you can expand access to testing and so guarantee higher level of traceability. And the increased frequency of testing can also maximize the capacity to identify positive asymptomatic individuals. So overall, I believe that this kind of test is a very promising and very useful test for uh, helping us to control and to develop a more efficient strategy to stop the current pandemic of COVID-19. And um, well, I thank you for your attention and uh, I'm of course open any question in my head. Thank you. Thank you, Vittorio, for your informative presentation. We will now go ahead and start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you okay. have a question you'd like to ask, um, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. Our first question is, in what situation could antigen tests be useful? Well, I believe that the antigen testing are useful potentially in all the situation in which you need to be very uh, time uh, effective in providing the answer. And uh, uh, you know, that means you need to have a very uh, reduced turnaround time and in all the situation in which you need to control a, a large amount of population that can be tested all together. So provided that they have a very high specificity and a very high sensitivity, I believe that this kind of test could be uh, very helpful in order to stop the transmission of COVID-19 because they, they allow the Department of Public Health to go uh, for a more uh, efficiently uh, tracing, uh, traceability, tracing activity and uh, so that uh, we can uh, enlarge the number of people that 
uh, could be screened for the presence of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Now, what about convalescent patients? Well, I, I also believe that these kind of tests uh, uh, are applicable and they could be used also to test the convalescent patient because what we do need to uh, know when a patient is exiting, is finishing the COVID-19 clinical uh, uh, picture, is if this subject that is recovering under the clinical point of view are still spreading uh, infecting virus. And uh, since these tests are less sensitive than RT-PCR, they have a higher limit of detection, I believe that these tests can be very helpful not to identify as positive people that are spreading the virus at the level that has been widely demonstrated not to be infected in, in cell culture. So I believe this is a very uh, important field of application of these tests. Okay, thank you. What is your what is your opinion and experience on saliva as a clinical sample to detect SARS-CoV-2? That's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, 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 we we started to make some uh, evaluation of uh, tests performed on saliva, and uh, I could say that uh, if you go for RT-PCR testing the use of saliva provides results that are affordable as the result that you get by the same test by using the nasopharyngeal swabs and secretions. So uh, if you go for PCR, there is no so much difference in between the use of saliva and nasopharyngeal specimen. Uh, I have no wide experience on the, the antigenic testing. I know that there are many different uh, tests currently under development. Uh, based on saliva and antigenic, antigenic detection. And I believe that this could be a very good opportunity for the future, for the near future, hopefully, because we do need to simplify the pre-analytical steps in order to uh, make a larger cohort of people uh, tested uh, for COVID-19. Okay, I have one more question. Mm-hmm. For how long do you think we will continue to perform monitoring of SARS-CoV-2? Do you think perhaps the middle of next year? Uh, yeah, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I cannot provide precise uh, answer to this question, but my feeling that is based with discussion with uh, people that is involved in the epidemiological analysis of the data that they have available on a daily basis. Yeah, I believe that all of these uh, huge amounts of testing will not decrease or stop before the middle of the next year. So I'm expecting that the situation could ameliorate a little bit by beginning of the next summer, but uh, this is just a guess, or better, this is just a hope. Thank you, Vittorio. Do you have any final yes. comments for our audience before we go today? Yeah, if I can make a comment, is uh, uh, is a comment that I would like to address to my colleague virologist is please do not stick your idea on the necessity to have a very high sensitivity testing for RT-PCR. Because according to the discussion that we currently on a daily basis we have with the infectious disease specialists and with the ICU doctors and with the Department of Public Health doctors, uh, I can tell you that uh, if you use a very sensitive RT-PCR for screening purposes, I'm not talking about diagnostic, I'm talking about screening of population, I would say that you will probably provide the data that are not completely fitting into the clinical need. You will be detecting people that are by sure positive according to the RT-PCR result, but these people are likely not to be infected if the CT are uh, above 33 or 35. So this is making not so much sense under the clinical point of view. This is my comment. So we need to have you know, additional testing approach that is probably more fitting in these clinical and epidemiological needs. That's my comment, thank you. 
Well, thank you very much, Vittorio, for your time today and your important research. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. We would also, yes, thank you so much. We would also like to thank Labrus and our sponsor, Dia Soren, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their questions. Any questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand and Labrus will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. Until next time, goodbye. Bye. Bye.